So hello everybody. Um, I can see a bunch of people has already joined us um, for this escalation webinar and you've already started introducing yourselves in the chat. So hello, hi those of you who are introducing yourselves. Um, a little bit about myself. My name is Lucy Kadena. Um, I use the pronoun she and her and I'm based in Budapest um, in Hungary. I'm from the UK originally and I've been part of the international climate justice movement for about the past 10 years now. Um, I started off as a youth climate activist, which is why I'm super excited to be part of this project and to be supporting the school strikers in this way in September. Um, this webinar is called Escalation and it's one of three webinars that we're running on a kind of rolling repeating basis over the next few weeks. Um, the other two webinars are on goals and strategy and on going big, so recruiting, outreach, that kind of thing. Uh, and these webinars are designed really to be taken in any order, so don't worry if this is your second webinar that you joined or your third. Um, they can be taken in any order, they all kind of overlap um, and they're designed to be kind of complementary in that way. Um, so I want to say hello to those of you who are introducing yourselves in the chat. So hi Grace, hi Georgie, hi Yoko, uh, hello Arvind, Bethany, Neil, Johnny, Sarah, and I can see there's some people who have joined the other webinars before, so welcome back to you. Um, you'll notice that you're on mute at the moment and you will be muted for the duration of this call but don't worry there is going to be a chance to come off mute during parts of the call for the discussion um, and I'm going to run you through some of the kind of tools that we're going to use with Zoom today. So some of you might be familiar with Zoom, some of you may not be but hopefully it's going to be pretty simple. So a lot of you have already uh, discovered the chat box. So that's probably our most used Zoom tool. Um, and we're asking you to type in your introductions, um, which everyone is doing. So that's just also to get you practicing using that chat box. And you can use the chat box at any point during this webinar to communicate with me, with any of the other participants. Um, just one thing to make sure is that when you are sending a message in the chat, there's a little blue drop down menu and you can choose who you're sending the message to and we would recommend you put it to all panelists and attendees because that means that everybody's going to be able to see your message. What we're going to use is the question and answer box, the Q&A. So you might see that in your little Zoom window, a little Q&A box. Um, we don't use this as frequently, but it's there if you want to put a question in there that you don't want to get lost as the, as the chat box kind of scrolls up. So we'll try and answer your question live if we can, um, or we'll save these questions to the question and answer um, session at the end. Uh, there's also a tool which is raise hand, so you'll see this little hand signal. And so during the webinar, there might be times when I ask people to share, I invite you to come off the mic. So if you'd like to share in that way, if you'd like to speak, um, then do raise your hand and I'll take you off mute. Um, and another tool that we'll be using is the poll, but you won't be able to see that in your, in your Zoom window yet. You'll see that when it pops up when I launch a poll. Um, and just to note that if you're joining via a voice call on your phone, then I'm afraid you won't be able to take part in the poll, but I can explain what's happening and that kind of thing. So, um, so hello to everybody who's, who's writing in their hellos. Uh, so we have people from Mexico, we have people from Kenya, Paul, hello, Indonesia, Chile, um, Abby, hello. Um, and Niket, thank you for saying, for typing in your hellos. And that reminds me that we have one person on the call um, that I'd like to introduce who is our tech person. So that's Nicole today. Nicole, do you want to say hello? Hi, everyone. So Nicole is going to be there 
for for you really if you've got any problems with zoom um that nicole might be able to help you with just just reach out to her and she's also going to be helping me as well um so just to let you know we are recording this webinar we record all the webinars and that's really for training purposes and also for you to watch back as well at your leisure um so a big hello to everybody and uh let's get started so what you're going to need for this webinar is I'd advise having a pen and paper um, just to write your own notes. Um, and this webinar is kind of designed to be interactive. So we're inviting you to take responsibility for your own learning and just engage with the questions as much as possible because that will help us to move forward with the webinar. So the agenda today is, first of all, we're going to talk about why disruptive action, why a strike. Then we're going to talk about getting used to stepping outside of our comfort zones when it comes to the climate strikes. We're going to discuss differing levels of risk that different people will face uh, when it comes to the strikes. And then finally, we're going to make a sort of plan of action together. And then I'm going to take you through some of the resources that are available for you. So I'm going to kick off now with a poll. So, um, as I mentioned, if you're joining by voice, voice call, I'm afraid you won't be able to see this, but everybody else should have just seen a box kind of pop up on your screen. And what we're asking in this poll, you can start filling it in straight away. It's just for us to get an idea of the experience level on this call and, and who's in our sort of virtual room. So we're asking, have you been involved in a climate action event before? Um, so no or yeah, one, maybe two, um, or I'm a regular activist, I do this all the time kind of thing. And then are you connected up with other local activists? So again, it's a multiple choice. Yes, I'm involved in a local climate action group, or there's a group locally, I'm not involved yet, or there isn't a group, I want to start one, or I don't want to be part of a group, that's also an option. Um, so um, those of you, I can see all of the responses coming in fast you can't see this but I can see it but I'm going to give you another five seconds to fill that out so five four three two one okay so I'll just share the results there with you and thanks Georgie for taking part during uh, through the chat as well um, it's good to see answers and get to know who's here and it looks like almost half of you are complete newbies here so it's going to be your first time taking action in September which is super super exciting and I want to extend a very warm welcome to you um, we have a few regular activists and some people who have taken action before so a little a bit of a mix there uh, we have most people by a small margin uh, know that there's a group locally or are involved in a climate action group already and a few people would like to start one, which is quite exciting. So thanks for uh, taking part in the poll. Um, uh, sorry that you can't see the poll, Georgie. Um, uh, I'm not sure why not, but uh, yes, I'm sorry about that. Um, it should have popped up on your screen. Um, so we're gonna first of all talk about why, why disruption. We're gonna start with the basics. What is gonna make the global climate strike different to previous days of action. So why a strike? And I'd like you to start off by imagining um, a little scenario. So we're asking what if Greta had taken, so Greta Thunberg, our friend, who's uh, sailing to New York at the moment, uh, what if Greta had taken action on Saturdays instead of Fridays? So instead of going on strike and, and from school and sitting outside Parliament on Fridays, what if she'd done that on Saturdays? So I'd like you to pull up the chat box and just put your thoughts in there, the first thing that comes into your head. How would it have been different? Hmm. So Grace, absolutely, not as much attention. Great, great answer, Georgie. It would have been easy to ignore. I think that's that's really it. Would not have been impactful. There's no school on Saturdays, less visibility, lesser impact. Yeah, so I think we're all agreed that it wouldn't have been disruptive. It wouldn't have had the same kind of impact 
that it has had. And actually, we, we don't really have to imagine because we've been doing climate marches on weekends for years. So it's about 10 years since 350.org organized the first global day of climate action. And of course, there are reasons for this, right? Okay, so, so it's more accessible to people to, to hold something like that on a weekend. Um, more people are more likely to show up and that's, that's a reasonable ass assumption. But as you've all said, you know, that makes it easier to ignore, right? Um, so now young people are actually asking us to strike and strikes are disruptive. They're disruptive to businesses, to education, to industry, to the economy. And so this is really what's, what's led to escalated attention on the climate movement this year. So I wanna give a nice quote here from Martin Luther King, which goes that nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such attention that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks to dramatize the issue so it can no longer be ignored. And of course, Martin Luther King wasn't talking about climate change, right? But this is really pretty familiar. So we know that climate change is a crisis, but it's not being treated as such by most governments and particularly not those in the global north. So by interrupting our systems as Extinction Rebellion, Fridays for Future, the school strikes have done, just as many, many movements have done over the years, they've recreated a crisis on the ground in practical terms. And in this way, those in power are forced to confront the issue. Another quote here from Shrudja Popovic from the time of the Serbian uprising, and this, this successfully led to regime change in 2000. And the quote goes, by themselves, rulers cannot collect taxes, enforce repressive laws and regulations, keep trains running on time, prepare national budgets, direct traffic, manage ports, print money, repair roads, keep food supply to the markets, make steel, build rockets, train the police and the army, issue postage stamps, or even milk a cow. So people provide these services to the ruler through a variety of organizations and institutions. And if the people stop providing these skills, the ruler cannot rule. So this kind of reveals how much power we really have if we look at it in these terms and how the current system relies on all of us to support it and keep it going. So without that, we know that the system wouldn't work, it would crumble. So what's interesting about a strike, uh, taking, going on strike in this way, is that you're kind of interrupting two systems, right? You're disrupting the, the system that you're leaving, so your workplace or your school, and then you're also disrupting the place where you're heading to, to gather. So it might be a street or a town square. So in that sense, you know, there's two sites of disruption and there's also two communities of solidarity. So there's your colleagues and fellow students, and then there's the other protesters that you're joining. So my question to you now is thinking about your, uh, your context and your plans for your climate strike, where are you gonna be striking from? So it might be a workplace, it might be school, but give us a bit of information. So the type of workplace or school, the number of people there. So start typing into the chat now, where are you gonna be striking from? Okay, so someone's workplace. Uh, Belen says work, so 200 employees at your work, okay. Yoko, a school of 56 preschoolers, great. University of Central Florida, college. So we've got workplaces, we've got universities, we've got colleges, we've got schools, different types of schools, preschools, prep schools. Excellent, okay, amazing. So we've got a real variety there. And now I wonder if you can guess what the next question is. So the next question that I want you to tell me is where are you planning to go and maybe this is figured out for you at the moment maybe it's not planned yet but where are you and your your colleagues your fellow students where are you going to be marching to what are you going to be doing okay we've got a neighborhood neighborhood park las vegas strip amazing 
that sounds very exciting a marketplace okay so you're going to be disrupting you know a center of commerce it sounds like where else are people going to be marching to or or sorry striking and and moving to current ideas okay local environmental department okay great choice okay wow a very powerful place so where the pulse nightclub shooting vigil was held okay wow that's going to be very powerful public plaza capital city center football field city hall representative office okay so there's it looks like there's a ton of different types of targets that we have we've got a real mix there of sites of disruption where you're going to be moving to and it's likely that there's going to be you know during your strike there's going to be many many different places in one town that people are striking from but maybe only one or two places where people are going to come and gather so that's where you're going to you know feel the real people power so now that we're going to we're going to move into looking at uh some examples of effective disruptive action either recently or historically and i wondered if you're able to give me some examples, maybe something that you've seen in the news recently, maybe something that you've read about or you know about historically, of examples of effective disruptive action and type those into the chat. Arvind, <laughs> you're, you're eagle-eyed. You've seen everything on the next slide. I thought that I backtracked quick enough so you couldn't see it. So, okay, we've got Extinction Rebellion in London. Great, okay, that's a really good example. Blocking streets and airports, as in Hong Kong. Okay, so I think Hong Kong is really on everybody's uh, mind at the moment. Um, Belen, yeah, Greta did that alone. Um, she, she disrupted and was successful. Um, doing her disruption alone. Uh, the Parkland student protests, uh, I don't know about those, Bethany, maybe you wanna expand on that maybe a little bit? Okay, so we've had some examples. Okay, oh, after the, oh, the Parkland school shooting. Okay, I understand. Um, the the uh, the march for our lives um, against the guns uh, protests yeah they were they were they've been incredibly effective powerful gaining media attention absolutely and disruptive as well so we have a few examples I mean we've been crowdsourcing these different examples from the different uh, webinars we've been holding so a few other ideas that people had of course we have the protests in Hong Kong the Yellow Vest movement in France, um, Extinction Rebellion again, sit-ins, blocking oil rigs. Um, and we have some more examples of, for example, strikes and people withdrawing their labor. So, you know, a, a recent example of this is Italian dock workers who refused to allow Saudi, sh Saudi ships with weapons in protest um, of the, what's going on in Yemen. Uh, we've had economic boycotts, so for example, the South African boycott, um, the boycott of South African goods to end apartheid in South Africa. Um, toppling of statues, so for example, those iconic images that came out of Iraq. Um, the Kai activists, who are very close to our hearts, um, so a group of, you know, people in kayaks, basically, blocking oil rigs. Um, we've had some great examples of disruption from Black Lives Matter who've been blocking highways, bridges, stopping deportation flights, that kind of thing. And then on a, sort of another scale, we've seen sustained civil disobedience, movements of civil disobedience, which have led to actual real regime change in the Philippines, for example, in 1986 and in Serbia in the year 2000. So I think one of the one of the kind of takeaways from this is that these examples have been very successful 
And many people think that, you know, protesters choose nonviolent disruption, civil disobedience or strikes to be troublemakers, to be the most radical ones, or they choose it because it's the moral choice or the more principled choice, or they choose it because they're fed up of everything else. Um, and these are all valid reasons, but actually one of the main reasons people choose disruption is because it works. Um, and it often works where other tactics have failed and it's been proven to be a highly effective strategy for bringing about lasting change at scale and perhaps even the most effective strategy. So we're changing the way that we're approaching climate activism to better reflect the urgency and the scale of the crisis. And this also means that we're trying to create a new normal in climate activism, one which is going to shift public perception of the scale of the crisis and hopefully encourage more people to be supportive of our demands. So here's another kind of scenario that I'd like you to imagine. Uh, imagine that you're in a crowded restaurant and a fire alarm goes off and the servers keep serving drinks and people keep chatting and eating as normal. It's likely that you're going to copy them right you're going to shrug and continue as you are but then imagine that someone comes in and says this is an emergency there's a fire everyone needs to evacuate and then the first table stands up to leave everyone's likely to follow right so with the climate strikes we are those people demonstrating the urgency and we're hoping that people follow us so now we're going to explore a little bit more about what it means to go on strike from work or from school and to take to the streets and what this might look like for different people in different contexts. So I'm going to launch another poll now. Uh, here we go. This is hopefully going to pop up on all your screens. And we want to know now how comfortable or prepared do you think people in your workplace or school are to take action? So do you think they're already engaged and ready? Do you have an idea of some colleagues or fellow students who you think is, are gonna be into this and helping you to make it happen? Or do you think that there's gonna be a lot of resistance? Do you think it's gonna be a big challenge? So if you can, could you fill in the poll? And we'll see, we'll see where everybody is. And the reason we're doing this poll is, you know, we want everybody to be fully ready. And we want to know, are you going to be going on strike with only a few friends, close friends from your team? Or are we going to try and get the whole class or the whole department or the whole school or workplace to go out on strike? So five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. There you go. Okay, so it looks like half of you uh, have an idea in your head already of some colleagues or fellow students, or maybe you're already organizing with them um, to try and make this happen. Um, a couple of people feel like, yeah, we're ready. Let's do this, which is fantastic. And there's some people who feel like it's going to be a challenge. And that's okay. We're going to talk about that on this webinar and on the other webinars as well. So we're going to have a little brainstorm now and it's time to get that pen and paper you fetched at the beginning of the webinar. And I'm going to give you one minute from now. I would like you to write down three different people. So for example, your mum, a colleague, a hairdresser, a friend, people who you think you might meet in the next 24 hours and who you can have this conversation with asking if they will join. So I want you to write down on the paper those three names and I'm gonna give you about a minute to do that. So start writing now. Oh, and if anybody finishes before that one minute, then do feel free to share in the chat. Okay, so hopefully all of you have three names down on your piece of paper. 
so my follow-up question now is of those three people who is going to be easiest to convince to join and who is going to be the hardest person to convince to join the strikes and i want you to write these into the chat box so it would be great if you can put you know the name of the person plus your relationship to them so maybe don't just put john because i don't know who john is so just put your you know the easiest person that you think you're going to be able to convince pretty easily and then who's going to be the hardest Okay, so Rena, is that person who's running for city council, are they gonna be the easiest person to convince to join, do you think? She'll be the easiest, okay. So staff members are easier to invite because they're already aware of the urgencies, okay. Easiest activist friend, okay, so already active. Hardest your daughter. Okay. Rachel class, classmate has done gun, the gun violence walkout will be the easiest. So or people who are already activists, it looks like these, these people are gonna be pretty easy to convince. I mean, they may not, they may not still be easy, but they're gonna be easier maybe. Okay, hardest will be the people around the school such as the parents, okay. Okay, so for those people who, uh, who, for whom it's gonna be hard, um, I'm hoping that you're gonna ask them anyway. Um, and try and think about the reasons as well why you think it's gonna be hard to convince them because actually some of those reasons may not exist. Um, and what I mean by that is that sometimes we make assumptions that people don't, aren't already active on climate change because they don't care. And a lot of the time, that's not the reason. A lot of the time it's because they haven't yet found a way of becoming active. They haven't found their entry point. They don't know what they can do. So hopefully we're providing them with something to do. So we're gonna look at some of the barriers that might prevent these people from participating in a strike. And I think that we've already surfaced a few of those barriers. So, for example, one of the barriers is that, uh, you know, some people don't believe in climate change. OK, so there's there's a very obvious barrier right there, uh, which is kind of ideological barrier. Um, and Belen said, you know, some colleagues some colleagues are scared, okay, scared to take the time to strike. So what might they be scared of? What might be the barrier? So I want you to think about these people who might be holding back from taking part in the strikes. What are those barriers holding them back? And maybe you can type into the chat some answers. Maybe you've thought about this. Okay, people might not want to strike because they don't want to inconvenience others at our workplace who will have to fill in from them, for them. That's a good point, actually, yeah. Uncertainty, so some people are not sure whether that's actually gonna make a difference. Fear of getting fired, yeah, this is, this is a very understandable one, yeah. So in people, you know, for people for whom, you know, their job is not secure, especially, um, who are not allowed to strike, for example, that might be an even bigger risk. Fear of being laughed at, fear of getting a no from their boss. Yeah. Okay, so we have quite a few fears here coming out as barriers. So fear of being alone, fear of sort of standing out and, and you know, being the only one doing this. Um, people people, I guess, underestimating the threat of climate change or not believing in it. So thinking it won't affect them, not believing in climate change. 
and people uncertain whether what they're doing is going to make a difference and you know that's a very reasonable uh, concern for example so thank you nicole is typing in your answers into the sheet here and i'm going to share with you you know a few of the other ideas that we've had that have come through these webinars um one of those barriers oh sorry let me just see i've, I've got them i think i might have deleted them sorry <laughs> oh that's okay that's okay because what we can do now is we can focus on some of those barriers and think about what might be some of the supports that we might offer to people so for example if your friend is uncertain that, that what they're going to do is going to make a difference how can you help them to overcome that uncertainty how can you still inspire them to be part of it and you can type in the chat your ideas you can raise your hand as well Let me see if we have some of our supports here. Yeah. Okay, so Georgie says, yeah, let's point to examples. So Greta, the LFS civil rights movement. So this is one of the reasons we started off with this, uh, with this kind of brainstorm thinking about all of these really effective, disruptive actions that have happened, um, that have been incredibly successful um, and showing that this is a real, this is a strategy the climate movement until this year maybe or last year hasn't really employed at scale and this is why it's going to work inspire people to be a part of it because of their lives and the lives of their children absolutely so i think that we have these kind of ideas about how to start these conversations and how to remove some of those barriers some of the ideas that we came up with as well are so for example we've listed some of these barriers and and there's some examples that we came up with earlier um throughout the course of these webinars uh, about you know some of you have, have have like alluded to this financial risk the job security risk so what are the kind of things that we can put in place for people to kind of feel like that's a risk they can overcome so for example, solidarity funds might be something that you might want to employ. Um, this idea that you can't make a difference. Well, we've got all these examples of historical change that have used this strategy that we're employing and have brought about lasting change. Um, this kind of fear of being alone, you know, why don't we set up affinity groups or buddy pairs? Um, I want to pick up on this point really from Neil as well. It's important to manage expectations at this stage. The gathering can help grow a movement for eventual direct action, even if it doesn't cause immediate policy changes. I think that's a really good point, Neil. I think that what we're trying to, what we're trying to do is we're using these goals, these massive sort of high level goals of like system change, uh, ending fossil fuels. We don't expect that this one climate strike is going to achieve that, right? But what it is going to do by using these sort of motivational movement building objectives, we're going to get the masses out. We're going to be able to, to, to cause disruption in a way which is going to catapult the issue onto the agenda of those people who can do something about it. So I think that's a really good point. Thank you, Neil. So moving on i mean we've we've already started to touch on this when we talked about people you know facing a financial barrier and that kind of thing um and i think that this has arisen in, in sort of various places but we want to give it a bit of attention we want to make sure that our event draws on the strengths of everyone who's participating right but we know that people in certain communities experience a different level of risk and different barriers and maybe you know more substantial barriers to participating in certain strikes or protests so i've got kind of a different question now which is what additional risks or barriers might these kinds of 
people in these communities experience when attending a protest. So oppressed ethnic minorities, for example, women, children, elders, disabled people, LGBTQ people, low income workers, people in precarious work. What are those sort of additional risks or additional levels of risk that they might face or barriers that they might face um, when they're wanting to participate in this kind of protest event? So, so we've had a comment that minorities sometimes are the my, most dynamic and dedicated. I think that's a really good point. And what we want to impress is that we're not talking about um, so much creating space within our movement, right? We're not, we're not so much talking about that as we are talking about learning from the experiences of communities who have been often doing the most radical um, work in the most difficult circumstances in terms of activism for a really long time and making sure that we're drawing on those strengths and drawing on those experiences and inviting people into a, a, a space that is safe and is going to address those kind of um, inequalities. So violence, harassment, prejudice from others, uh, prejudice from others, not being able to afford the lost wage hours for low income people, absolutely. Further stigmatization. Yeah, opponents using their status to distract from the issue or marginalize protesters. Make sure every single person feels included and every person can make a difference. People of color might be targeted by police when protesting, protesting even while white people do the same thing. Yeah, this is certainly true in many parts of Europe, in, in the US for sure, historical violence from, from officials. So I think that, yeah, physical harm and risk. So I think that, I think, you know, we've all got this. I mean, if one of my friends uh, who I'm asking to participate in this, um, in this global action, for example, if they, are, uh, if they are a migrant worker who's not sure of their working status and rights, it's likely they're going to face a higher legal risk and a higher job security risk, right? Maybe some of you might have heard of um, a recent raid by the immigration officials in the US by ICE on a chicken pro processing plant in Mississippi that targeted, um, that targeted those migrant workers who had already been on strike and had already been fighting for better work conditions. So these are the kinds of extra risks that people uh, from these communities might face when carrying out a kind of protest that, you know, others from the majority may take for granted. And, and, and one of you quite rightly, yeah, said that, you know, for example, in many, in many countries, people of color are going to face a much higher risk to their physical or legal safety. Um, as you know, even when those communities gather peacefully, they're more likely to be targeted by authorities, they're more likely to face higher penalties and sometimes even physical risk to themselves. So, I mean, I think that we all get this, but, but some reasons for being diverse and inclusive, you know, we talk about this a little more in the goals and strategy webinar, but the root causes of the climate crisis are grounded in white supremacy, are grounded in capitalist neoliberalism, you know, the root cause is this idea that some people's profit is more important than other people's well-being. And so this is something we are going to be challenging with every action that we take. Also, recognizing that in a, in a state of emergency, we do risk further marginalizing or scapegoat, scapegoating certain communities, stripping them of their rights. And we need to practice solidarity in every action that we take. And quite simply, if we don't include people, if we're exclusive, if we stick to our little bubble, we're never gonna reach a critical mass of people power that's needed. So I want to tell you a little case study thinking about you know, ways that we can, we can diversify the roles within our actions to make it more inclusive and to, and to have different levels of risk within our actions. I want to tell you a little story which is in the climate resistance handbook, which is the story of a student um, who was living under the 
repressive authoritarian regime in Mongolia in the 1980s, a student called Hashbat Hulan. And uh, on International Human Rights Day in 1989, Hashbat and around 200 students organized a protest in the main square of the capital. And this was quite a radical act at the time. It was quite risky, but it got people's attention and it cut through the media propaganda. So next they created um, an organizational structure. They created roles and tactics. They organized coordinating committee meetings, open meetings, which is kind of the opposite to what the government was doing, which were attended by thousands of people. And at some point, the students decided to go on hunger strike. So obviously high risk tactic, high risk strategy, going on hunger strike. And they did this in like publicly in, in the main square when it was minus 15 degrees. And they got a huge amount of attention and publicity. And they reached out to allies to support, but they didn't ask everybody to do the hunger strike. They just asked people to support in a way that's disruptive, but in a way that feels safe for people. So for example, 500 mine workers stopped work for an hour in solidarity. So not for the whole day, because they, that was obviously a risk that they couldn't take, but they stopped work for an hour. And symbolically, this is, you know, this showed how, how, how much they were aligned with this movement, how much support they supported this movement. Monks joined, they offered support, and teachers went on strike. So teachers did go on strike. Um, in the long term, they withdrew their labor. And eventually this worked and the students got their demands. Uh, they managed to mount the pressure and become successful and have their demands for democratic elections met. And some of the principles in this story that we can learn from are, of course, solidarity and support and consent and, and you know, doing what you feel comfortable with, but also allowing there to be differing, le differing, differing levels of engagement, differing roles. So what we're saying here is, is, not, is not that everybody should be able to just choose what's the easiest thing for them to do, right? Because this isn't really about what's easy. It's about determining what is the most impactful and disruptive action that you can take whilst also ensuring your safety, right? So that's really what we're asking. So now my question for you, the last question is really, how could you design your strike action to include differing levels of risk or diverse roles? So, once again, I want you to type into the chat if you have any ideas for roles which might be a lower level of risk, might enable people who are willing to take more risk, and still might be disruptive, but might en enable more people to take part. So Bethany already, I have a friend who's unable to strike but is helping us to plan the event. Okay, so a behind the scenes role um, is definitely you know, something that you could offer out to people. Lower risk sharing on social media, helping to create banners or content. Yeah, absolutely, Yoko. I think, you know, certainly during your strike, you might need somebody sat somewhere with really good internet connection who is just blasting out all of the tweets that are coming through from the strike. It's, it's, it's a low risk uh, job, but somebody's got to do it, right? A group of parents that's unwilling to hold signs but had the idea of creating a line of parents holding hands to show their support. That's really nice. I think that's a really nice way of, you know, acting in solidarity, but maybe not taking on that risk of, of being noticed. Excellent. I think these are really good ideas. People who can't afford losing wage hours during prime time could help with prep off hours, could direct attention to the strike at their work. Excellent. Some great ideas, climbing, some holding banners, some securing the area, talking to press, absolutely. Getting permission from climate change department, okay. Okay, yeah, saying that it's gonna be a peaceful protest to educate and spread awareness. Okay, so ways of sort of mitigating the risk as well. I like that, I like that idea. So I think that, you know, this is a great exercise to do to sort of make sure that your event really is inclusive and is recognizing, I think most of all, 
those differing layers of risk that people are able to or not able to take on. Uh, okay, Johnny, you are creating a viral video. Wow, with multiple sources. Okay, that sounds very, very exciting. Maybe you can tell me more about that later. Um, so I think that, I think we've seen that there are loads of different types of ways that we can get people involved. But again, making sure that it's not just sort of like the easiest thing to do, that people are stepping outside of their comfort zones, but they're doing it in a way that's safe for them, right? So now it's time to put our learnings into practice. So what we would like you to do is to, is to practice, is to have those conversations. So you've all listed like three people, right? That you think you'll come across in the next 24 hours that you think you might be able to talk to. So our task for you, our challenge is to talk to them, to ask them if they wanna join, can you join us? And keep that conversation going, right? If they say yes, then you know, ask how they're feeling about it, see how they can be involved, maybe give them a role. If they don't want to take part, it'd be great to hear more about what's holding them back. And maybe it's one of these barriers that we've discussed and maybe you feel like there's a way that you can persuade them to take part. And the second part of this task is to report back. So we actually have a Facebook group. So some of you might already know, but we have um, a Facebook group. We've set it up for you folks to support each other, to write your reflections um, and to give each other advice and to help each other along this journey. So um, I'm gonna ask my tech person, Nicole, if you can possibly type in, there you go. So the, the, the link to the Facebook group is in the chat box now. You can already click on it. You can already request to join. I will approve your request. Um, and really this group is for you, so to share your learnings and to ask each other questions. If you don't have a Facebook uh, account, you can also report back to me via email. And that's my email there, lucy.cadena at 350.org. And so I want to spend a bit of time just going through some of the resources that are available to you during this time and make sure that you have the support you need. So um, the first, I mean, obviously is the climatestrike.net, globalclimatestrike.net website. Hopefully you're all kind of familiar. Maybe some of you have used this to, this, to register for this webinar, uh, but I wanted to draw your attention to some of these resources and we're adding resources all the time. We're updating this website all the time. So there's a really, really um, useful frequently asked questions there, which has got most of the information you're, you're really going to need to know about the context of the global climate strikes, what's planned, what's planned in different places. Um, and there's a super little nifty map there with, with new events cropping up all the time. So you can find one near you, join up with a group near you if there is, or start your own. There's some really nice posters and stickers here, loads of promotion materials. Um, which you can use on social media or even off social media. So if you can print out some of these, these are super great. I want to show you some of these uh, like closed signs. So you can print these off. These are like little stickers and you can put them on your workplace door or, you know, your office building or your university or stick them all over town. And um, they're just really cool and they'll help to get a lot of attention. So there's tons of different resources here on this website for you. Um, another great resource that I want to draw your attention to is the Climate Resistance Handbook, um, which is a handbook that we've been drawing from for these webinars, for these trainings. And there's a link there to it. Um, and this is actually a free resource. So you can scroll down and you can download your free copy as a PDF. And it's written by Daniel Hunter with a, with a forward by Greta Thunberg. It's really great. Um, and this whole website as well, trainings.350.org, it's got tons and tons of resources um, to help you out. So it's worth having a little look through there. And of course, you can contact me at any time, um, lucy.cadena at 350.org. And if that's too long to remember, just help at 350.org and that will get you through to me. So I want to leave the space for any questions that we have. 
oh, Melissa said, please type these links. So I wonder if, Nicole, are you able to type those links into the chat so that people have them there and can copy them? Just to let you know that you'll also get an email after this webinar from me. And uh, we'll have all of these links in there. So, um, so you'll be able to look at them um, from there. Um, it's also going to remind you to register for the other topics if you haven't already. It's going to remind you of the Facebook group. Um, and it's also going to ask you if you've got any feedback, which we are always very, very grateful for. Um, and just also to mention, there's going to be a survey that will pop up after this webinar, which is, of course, completely optional. But it's going to help us monitor our progress in building a powerful, diverse movement. So we'd be really grateful if you can fill that out as well. So yeah, so let's take some questions. We have a few minutes now at the end. Um, I'm going to check and see if there's anything in the Q&A box. Uh, okay, so Carl asks, is it important that a person strikes from work? So what if the person can take a day off or use, pays, use paid holiday to attend? So I think Carl, I think this is, um, it's a really good question. And I think that it's all about um, again, looking at different levels of risk and what, what you are comfortable with, what, what is safe for you. So obviously we are recommending that as many people as possible do strike from work because that's really what's going what's gonna to cause that kind of shutdown effect. That's what's going to really disrupt the economy, um, industry, businesses, schools, that kind of thing. But again, it's about those differing layers of risk. Um, and those differing kind of barriers that people have. There are other ways, and there are, on, on the website, there are lots of different kind of ways that people can uh, contribute to the strikes. So for example, maybe you don't, maybe you still work that day, but you hold a workshop on climate, on the climate strikes, on climate action, for example. If you're a teacher, maybe you can do this as well. You know, you can use that day not to do schoolwork, but actually to hold these kind of trainings, that kind of thing. So there's a question from Rina, which is how to motivate, motivate people in a small city or school to join the protests even, oh, especially when you don't know the host. So I think that's a good question. And by the way, if anybody who feels like they have any answers to these questions, questions as well, please do um, take part. I think, you know, I come from a, a very small city and a very small school, and I'm thinking back to what this might have been like. Um, I think that the main thing that's going to really make people feel connected to something bigger than, than what they're doing is that kind of sense of global solidarity, is making people realize that they're part of something that's not just, you know, something small where they are but actually they're part of a global movement and a global action and everybody's doing this together so i feel to me being from a small school uh, a small city and a small school i feel like that would make a difference to me and that would motivate me and if you can think of ways to integrate that sense of global solidarity and that sense of it being a global moment into your action i think that would that would really make it a bit more powerful for people uh, we've got a question from Yoko. Could you recommend certain policy changes that can be used as a guideline and reference to make a city carbon free? Uh, I don't know if I have any because they are so circumstantial and context specific that I don't know whether I could recommend one sweeping policy recommendation. However, Yoko, I would really recommend that you come to our training on goals and strategy because that's where we're going to delve a lot more deeply into these questions of aims and policy changes and recommendations, both at, you know, at the global level, at the national level and at the local level. So I think if you can join us there, that would be really helpful. And I'm just checking. So Melissa says, our local elementary school principal is holding an assembly prior to each strike to teach kids about the climate crisis. She's pledged to allow students, teachers and parents to go on strike if they choose. That's fantastic. We need way more principals like that. That's mm -hmm. amazing. So 
Oh, Nicole, did you want to say something? No. No. <laughs> Just want um, to show my face. <laughs> <laughs> and Johnny's, Johnny's telling us about his viral video to reach over 100 million people uh, and wondering if I can put in, be put in contact with higher up. Okay, Johnny, I'm gonna to talk to you after this. Okay, let's chat after this webinar and talk about this viral video. Uh, and one question from Melissa, is there a list of scientists, professors, CEOs, companies, would be nice to send to other, other professors, et cetera, to say, look who's in, you're not alone. That's a fantastic question, actually, Melissa. Uh, I'm not sure if we have on the website that list. What we certainly do have on the website is um, a big list of the supporting organizations. Um, so there's a bunch of international partners. So there's like trade unions, there's lots of NGOs, there's kind of a real diversity of different partners. And, they, and that's kind of also down at the more specific regional level. There's, there's you know, look, all these many, many, many partners. Um, in terms of um, who's in, I mean, I think that there are, there are a few kind of open letters that have been sent around the kind of school strikes supporting the strikes. And so I don't have a list to hand, but I know that there are some kind of supportive letters with like a list of different professors and things like that. So I think that's a really great question, Melissa. And I will suggest to the team that we get some kind of list together like that. Okay, so uh, I think that I've answered all the questions and I, unless there are any more questions, I think that I'm gonna say a big thank you to everybody for joining. Um, and don't forget, you can get into contact with me at any point if you have any questions. Um, let us know how you get on in the Facebook group with talking to your three people. Um, and don't forget to sign up and register for the other webinars in this series because it would be great for you all to carry on because some of the questions that you've come up with, we're going to tackle in the other sessions as well. So a big thank you for joining for everybody. And um, if you're looking for how to leave the call, for those of you not familiar with Zoom, there's like a little leave, leave webinar sign somewhere here. So thank you everybody and see you on the next training. <laughs>